Welcome to the Five Phenomenon Podcast. I am your host, Shane Hazen. Coming up on this episode, once again, joined by Ted Haycraft. Yes, uh, I know, a.k.a. number six. I love how you just point that. It's like, yes, I am here. <laughs> yes. Uh, as you alluded, we are discussing, we're going to, we're, we're starting a new s- mini series. Uh, subset. Subset. Uh, T- tangent. Par- parsed out. Uh, even though we're a movie podcast, film entertainment goes across not just what's in cinemas, but also what plays on the idiot box too in front of you. So we are doing the uh, TV goats, the greatest of all times. And for our first selection, which we'll get into why we've chose this, is Ted's favorite, you'd say, you think? Uh, yes, it, it is hands down my number one favorite TV series. The Prisoner. Yes, um, the Prisoner. But first off, our normal preliminaries, Ted, uh, what did you watch this week? Because I know one movie I want to talk about is the movie we watched together. <laughs> and we both seen twice, but uh, we had different I, opinions on. I did watch a, uh, uh, due to uh, a Tarantino recommendation, uh, hands on a hard body you, documentary. I have uh, that's high on my list. You know, the, the, is, are you talking about that clip? It's of um, him on the Night Show with Jimmy Fallon and Jimmy Fallon. Uh, I guess it was. Yeah, I guess that's where I got it. Where he said, you know, they were asking us everything, you know, new. You're excited over, and he didn't have any really. He didn't have an answer at first, and then also he goes, "Oh yeah, yeah, yeah," and he came up with this documentary. And so I go, oh, okay, well, I need to check that out. That and, Well, it, the, the clip is cool because it's the one time where, like, Jimmy Fallon's like, I worked in a video store. And sometimes when people go up against Tarantino, it seems like the knowledge gets dwarfed. But, like, Fallon actually had, like, a, that was one of my recommendations. You know, um, Hands on a Hard Body, a, a live, or a, a, a feature, narrative feature that was supposed to be Robert Altman's last movie. Oh, okay. He yeah, was developing that, sounds, that, that when he died. Like, yeah. But yeah, it was. Uh, I, I ordered it right away, from, straight from the site. Uh, there, you know, you can what label? Few, what is it? Uh, I, I, it's whatever the film company is name. I can't pronounce it. It's uh, it, it's been on my watch list. You can, you, you can Google it. You can find it. You know, easily. And uh, she watch a Blu-ray. Uh, no, it's. I think it's. I don't think there's a Blu-ray of it. A DVD and it had extra. It has a bunch of extra interviews on it. Um, so I ordered. Uh, yeah, I can't watch it and enjoyed it. I. I. Uh, I, I. It was. I'm trying to figure out. It's what, a Texas town, right? Yeah, Longview, Texas, close to okay. Dallas. But I'm just curious what what uh, juiced uh, Quentin about it. Um, well, it's I, a really beloved documentary. I think it's just because it's so unpretentious. It, it, it really you get you get to see I think people as they really are, as opposed to Ken Burns where they're sitting down and you're you know you got your you got your scholars and your your very serious tone. You know, a lot of documentaries get this kind of uh, hot you know hot air type sure. feel, and I think this maybe that's why it's got a very uh, hands on, you know? <laughs> and uh, to use the, the word there, but um, yeah, I it was enjoyable, and um, I also revisited. A, 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 I've been a kind of off and on. I'm getting, going on a Sherlock Holmes tear of, as of late. I saw you watch one of these, and I watched Murder by Decree. Got the new Blu-ray in of that. I recommend everyone check out our letterbox uh, uh, profiles where we, you can see what we're watching weekly. Yeah, too. you don't have to have an account. You just. Type in Shane Hayes and her Ted Acraft yeah. and you see what we're watching. Murder by Decree. And Murder by Decree, yeah. It was uh, Bob Clark of all people. This is Porky's and Christmas Story director. Mm-hmm. And I mean, his, his he's worthy of a, a investigation of his career. But uh, he, uh, it's a it's a nice little film. It's it's the Jack the Ripper mashing up against uh, Sherlock Holmes, uh, and it's uh, Christopher Plummer as Holmes, and he's got the profile for it and, and uh, the attitude, and uh, you got uh, James Mason playing a good Watson. And an all-star cast. Everybody's in it. I, uh, one of my favorites, Frank Findlay from the Musketeer films. Mm. And uh, Dollar Sutherland and Genevieve Bouchot shows up in it. And Anthony Quayle and all kinds of people. So it's it's, it's a, it was a fun film. Um, uh, my interesting watch of the week was continuing my filling in all my holes on Alan J. Pakula. I watched Comes a Horseman. Oh, yeah. It, I wanted to ask you. I saw you. His follow-up to All the President's Men. Um do you have a do you have an opinion on Pakula in like the eighties and early nineties when he was still making it when his movies, well they, you they know, aren't as powerful. No, I mean I think this is one of the last. Well, I think this is one of the uh, the part of the. Uh, this could, actually, you know, what it reminds me of our Marnie conversation, which I think is a, a lot of people's Marnie's conversation. Where at the end. is this the last good Hitchcock movie, or is oh. it the first not great Hitchcock yeah. movie? This feels like that, just because. Well, you know, it's weird. It's an interesting cast, but the screenplay is very morally simplistic. The score is what throws it off because you you come from all the president's men where like there's all these very few David Shire cues out in it that come in very very little but most of the movies done in silence and this has this kind of I wouldn't say rah rah score but it's compared to you know Parallax View or this it's like it's an omnipresent score that really throws the movie off. Hmm. 
and uh, is very sincere and not a good way. I'll take a listen to that, but I, I, but it, it is Gordon Willis. It's it seems like a lot of the crew kept. Uh, he's, he is a Gordon Willis shot movie. Gordon Willis, I've seen two movies recently. He him that he shot mostly outdoors and during the daylight, and, and especially in this, when you see him shoot an interior, go back to an interior, it's just like it goes from like a nice outdoor shot, a decent outdoor overlaid shot, to what you expect Gordon Willis, like painting inside by taking away light, and it's just. There's no, there's it's a massive difference between the interiors and the exteriors, but, but the movie I wanted to talk about for this extended prologue, oh. uh, we both watched this twice, I believe. I, yes. I finished my second meeting last night, Suicide Squad, which we saw at IMAX, and I am still confounded. I really, I for the most part really liked it. I am confounded that you were indifferent to it. Yeah, indifferent is probably a good word. It's it's okay. I I, uh, I know this is you know you. One person can't be totally subject, uh, totally objective. It seems like when it comes to, the, and I, and there, uh, I've already done more, way more people that have your opinion. But on. I just think uh, it, it, it works. It's solid. As, as a te- that's one of my uh, copyrighted quotes. <laughs> solid. Uh, but I, I just didn't, I just didn't get uh, excited about it uh, the way I do. Uh, I, there's, you know, a handful of MCU movies that I come out going, wow, you know, or I can't believe they tapped into that uh, magic. Whereas DC movies, uh, you know, uh, post uh, Christopher Nolan, have just been such a mishmash, and I and I just almost want to, and I find elements in all of them. I like I think that I would say this this floats t- to the top better. Okay. Uh, I, it's up there with Wonder Woman, maybe, and and uh, I actually I think Aquaman's a solid film for what it is. Same. Uh, I, I'm surprised I like DC uh, universe movies more than you. I got because okay. I, I was really against them for a while because they were because yeah, it was because it, it, it wasn't a reflection on the universe or the characters it was the uh, Warner Brothers just didn't couldn't get their shit together. Yeah, I just think you know they just they they started out under the thinking they wanted to extend the Nolan feel and look and got and Snyder directing these things and and they just can't shake it off yet. They have you know and then they get then they're I think it to my mind I may be wrong on this and we'll and we'll see how it all comes out. There are some weird things with the Flash movie, but uh. Uh, Flashpoint. Yeah, uh, I bet. I think the Joker. You know, also they're just like now they're just saying, oh, screw it, let's just do these one-offs and 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 you know go for broke with certain tones and different styles and different whatever the multiverse. You know, mm-hmm. and so I don't know. We'll just see where it's. Uh, it's funny how the invention of the multiverse and the fifty-two universes is perfect fodder for a studio that fires its who's ever's <laughs> in charge every six months. Yeah, yeah, uh, they're gonna they're, they're gonna play that card, you know, and which is rightly so. But it's it's been kind of fun to see this uh, MCU experiment. I don't know how, I don't know how they, they're gonna be able to contain it forever. But well, in our after movie talk, I quickly I put it on. You seem to agree with this superhero fatigue. Seem like what I yeah, thought I you were so. witnessing. That, that could very well be. Uh, you know, because I love comic books, but I've also mostly you know. Uh, there's uh, I love the medium and I love and I love non superhero stuff. I know I you know I've had my I've had a fill of guys in underwear beating each other up. <laughs> so I don't know you know uh, that it's been kind of interesting to see it come to fruition finally. Yeah. But yeah, uh, <laughs> fatigue. <laughs> uh, the other thing I remember saying was because uh, it's a very hard R and it's some gory and I, I and I was talking about Slither, James Gunn's other. I mean, a lot of his movies have some excessive gore in it, but and you you just like I'm not a gore person. Uh, yeah, I I think I'm really not. I mean, I, I at the end of the day, uh, uh, it's oh, I mean, you know, Cronenberg, uh, gore is interesting. I uh, but I get squeamish. I get squeamish. You know, I I'm not. I, I don't take. I mean, this well, is, you, this the, is cartoon gore. I mean, yeah, is, you know. they're, they're, I re, when I rewatched it last night, literally one person when they thrown against a window turned into liquid, which like. The, the thing I found more interesting in my last watching was that uh, this is a type of morality where human life is pretty sacrificial and like stupid. But the, this is a movie about villains who, you know, are forced to be good guys and with the chip, you know, the chips in their brain. And what was notable to me was at the end, the thing that was the, the bottom line where they're like, and it keeps getting brought up multiple times in the movie is whenever children are endangered. That's when they're like, we can't do this. Children are endangered, even though like everyone else's life is just up for grabs. And I found it notable. I don't supposedly, well, I guess the timeline's right on that. 
But when James Gunn got fired from Guardians of the Galaxy 3, what was the tweet that got him in, the specific tweet that they trudged out that got him in trouble? Like, there was multiple tweets, but the main one was him being jokey about pedophilia. Oh. Eh? Mm. Nah? Nothing there? Something there? Yeah. Anyway, do we want to move on to the prisoner? Sure. All right, so for this series, I have a very specific reason we're doing this, which I don't know if I've adequately explained to you because you're constantly... Well, I should also point out that, God bless you, Ted, you watch the... the we're going to do three right now, and you watch them in this, like, when I originally... We originally planned on doing this 20 episodes ago, and we we're going to do The Prisoner first, and it's taken me this long to get through The Prisoner, but... Um, also, That's I should scary. That's scary. No, no, no. But I, I, I did like it. But I also, I think I've mentioned this on other episodes with us. But one of my f- first memories of you in person was when I was in class at USI, and I heard some guy four rows in front of me talking about prisoner references on The Simpsons, and I'm, both of us were writing at news for you at times, and but had never met in person. And I was like, oh, that must be Ted Haycraft. Ah. Interesting. I rewatched the Simpsons episode where McGowan was on. So that's where you, that's where you think um, that's where you think of my uh, about my prisoner. You heard about my prisoner obsession? No, 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 no. On. You'd written a news for you about prisoner. No. Oh, I had, I, oh yeah. yeah oh yeah. Prisoner had come up multiple times. Okay. But um, I kind of picked this episode for you. I'm glad you confirmed that as your favorite because I was I, I. It was kind of an excuse to finally get through this because I first tried watching the prisoner probably sometime around 2003 and it's taken me. Well, we're going on 18 years till I finally got through it. Mm. Um, and I feel like I've diminished your energy for just because you came in no, so excited about just, the prison. No, I'm disappointed that someone like you, that we have a lot in common, it seems like, that you seem to be somewhat underwhelmed. Uh, well, and, you, you also made a comment. And of course, I've probably built it up too much, too. It wasn't just you. I, I reread um, Alan Moore wrote, uh, did an interview just two years ago for the 50th anniversary. And it was seminal. I forgot he's only like four years difference between you and him. Yeah. And it was seminal, very similar ages, and it had the same effect on him. And he was such a big proponent of it. That was one of the reasons I wanted to get through it. Speaking of the 50th anniversary, I was looking at some of my, I, I dragged out some of my books off the shelf. Uh, one's uh, Alex Cox did a book for the 50th that anniversary. That seems so fitting. And well, okay. And I also saw a lot of Terry Gilliam in like the very, very fina- final episode. Ah. You, but well, but, let me, let me, let me, let me uh, lay the groundwork a little bit. Okay. Here. okay, okay. I, I want, if, 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 if that's okay with you, but go for it. Uh, go for it. Well, it's just, it's 1968. And, you know, my dad, you know, I forgot about how my dad had control of the television. There's only three channels. Uh, no cable, no VHS. Remember the three channel thing. I'm going to bring this up later. And uh, so I was always wondering why, why did I watch some of the things I watched? Because uh, your dad. And it was like you know, dad had first dibs. And then if dad was away or not around, I could you know take control and watch stuff I wanted to watch if I could you know get a chance to. But my dad and I had a lot of con- or I or I end up you know liking things that dad liked and and uh, and uh, so. Uh, a secret agent man was in the air as you know the spy craze and I was a we were my dad was a, a Bond film uh, fan and he took me to Bond films and I saw Bond films and I you know anything spy craze and was in a full tilt and uh, so what, was he did he like read any spy novels who your dad? dad no I don't think he read spy novels he he more he was more of a James Michener and I'm Thomas trying Custer. to get a picture of because part of the thing that helped me get into it was realizing that this was like really trying to take the bond trend the bond trend and it's different directions and go in like a really highbrow oh, direction yeah well that's the thing in magoo and here here he is he, he turned down he was off patrick magoon is the star of the prisoner and the creator co-creator he uh he was the highest paying british actor in the uk in the mid 60s he was doing this uh series called danger man uh, the second season was uh, an hour long. The first season was thirty minutes, but when it came over to America, the, the uh, hour long version was called was changed to Secret Agent Man, and they had Johnny Rivers do the the, the top forty hit, which was a big hit in, uh, in, mm-hmm. uh, on the radios and on the radios <laughs> radios. Um, and then so um, we're watching this stuff, you know. So and I'm sure Dad and oh my dad like Jack. I remember we watched the Jackie Gleason show. This was a summer replacement for the Jackie Gleason show. Summer replacement, which is important. To remember, we might come back to that. Okay. Um, 
and I'm watching this, you know, so I was, you know, I was pretty much a TV person when I was a kid. I actually end up... Kind You'd of, be like nine at this time. So I'm nine years old. That summer, I'm nine years old, and I'm watching The Prisoner. And I remember the Rover, there's this, 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 this big, giant white ball. Rover is... Uh, you, you've commented, you, the first question you had to me is like, what did you think of Rover? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, we'll get... To, we'll, we'll have to establish the uh, scenario of The <laughs> okay, Prisoner okay, in okay. a second. But... Uh, and to explain where Rover and all that stuff is. But uh, anyway, so I'm watching this show, and the last episode... Not only is it a very weird episode, and we'll get to that, but it's it concluded. He this guy was in the village. He was he couldn't get out, and he got out at the last episode. Oh, spoiler alert! I've already I've already spoiled that. You're spoiling a 53 year old <laughs> yeah. show now. <laughs> so I was just like, I couldn't believe it because back then, and TV shows now, everything has a you know seasons have cliffhangers. They wrap things up. They can come to conclusions. They explain why actors, you know, characters leave and come and go. Everything's, you know, finely tuned. You know, writing and television is so has such evolved uh, in such an um, amazing state nowadays that back then in '69 it was like, holy crap, this thing ended, and he got away. Well, and we'll talk about that. Did he, you know, about getting away? But he did. To my mind, to my nine years eye, he got out of the village and he got away. And he was he's back in his uh, hot rod car and he and he's like he's free man. I'm like, yeah. And because every cartoons and shows just also they'd be canceled, and it was in it. And I remember the cartoon Journey to the Center of the Earth cartoon. Uh-huh. They never got to the center. You know, it just it just you know things like that would happen all the time. You know, so, one of the things I've been thinking about. We need to get to the synopsis here in a second, but I, uh, for me, it seems like this is the birth of the mystery show, which got really popular, or, the, or you might call it the Reddit show, where everyone has sub theories on like what's happening, and uh, there's clear mystery set up that we're probably going to be not answered. For at least a season, if not uh, seven seasons, uh, things like Lost or Battlestar Galactica or earlier Twin Peaks. Well, Lost, I think, uh, isn't he Lost a, seems like the well, I think clearest. isn't he a, a avowed uh, fan of the? Prisoner? I haven't I looked th- up anything I saw he... about it, but it's it's so blatantly clear. But um, and I want to, I want, but but I want to ask you about the the Fugitive. Did you watch the Fugitive at this time? Actually, I don't. I have any strong memories of the Fugitive. Uh, believe it or not. Uh, but that, yeah, there was there is a wrap up on that too. I mean, there was always. I mean, I'm sure there's somebody out there who's going to call me, call me on the carpet on this because, uh, uh, you know. But I, it, I think you're right though. The, and because the fugitive is like it's still a setup for like a week week to week. It's yeah. just because and, and like. But let, yeah. let's get into the synopsis. But, we but, need but, to get one one other thing, before we get into the synopsis, one other thing I wanted to talk about is uh, why is this my favorite show, or the the the, the mechanics of this being my favorite show. I, 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 I use this quote all the time. I want to copyright it and trademark it. Tyranny of nostalgia. Uh, that, uh, you know, you, you see these things when you're eight, nine, ten years old, and you love them and you dwell on them and, and you love to go back to them and stuff like that. Uh, but then, you know, if you go back to some of this stuff, it's pretty kiddy or silly or simplistic, and but you still love it because it's that tyranny of nostalgia. I hate that you're bringing this up now because I wanted to really dive into this, but we need to get at the synopsis. Oh, okay, but I, I, well... Because Alan Moore was, at the, you know, only a diff- few years difference. But I, I, I was going to say, the main thing I was just going to say is that I'm so happy that, this holds up. that this holds up to to anybody this day. To my, I mean, it's kind of cool that some of that stuff that you did have, uh, you have a nostalgic feel for it, holds up while well, a lot of stuff doesn't you know anyway go ahead no you I, you wanted to do the synopsis right oh well the synopsis is uh i the, suck at synopsis synopses so, so, it, basically and you get this recap every ep- opening of the prisoner this uh, this guy this uh it opens with a title a really long title sequence that's a feature film unto itself yes that, which every time for like the first 10 episodes always fooled me because it would stop and then start back up like <laughs> it goes fades to black in the middle of the title sequence and the music stops uh yeah it's a it's a lovely sequence and uh basically this this man goes into an office resigns by hand if you look he's a spy uh, we well we assume. don't we yeah we don't know that okay we don't know that we really don't know that technically because even Magoon says well you could have been a scientist uh and really she said that yeah okay but well Magoon wants to play KG with the whole thing so we'll okay uh but anyway this guy resigns he obviously is packing for a vacation somewhere in the Caribbean or Tahiti or somewhere uh you see photographs and stuff I, I always picked it that he was trying to get out of town just like or he was leaving his life uh, well, I think I think well, yeah. I mean, but he he obviously wasn't because he kept the place. Uh, and he's uh, in this little you know nice little apartment. He has this really cool, uh, amazing little unique sports car, and uh, he uh, gets gassed. 
we see it. We see a hearse go by, you know, and it's like suspicious. And someone's watching him. And so obviously he's under surveillance. He wakes up, opens the curtains to he's in a same apartment, but he opens up the curtains uh, to the window and he looks out and he's in this weird, strange, uh, uh, architectural strange seaside. village, seaside village, and he's like, "What the heck?" And then basically it turns out. He was, we, we kind of find out he's been in some kind of secret, uh, very high, high, high end organization. They want to know why he resigned and they're going to try to get pride out of him no matter what they do. And then once you, uh, once they find that out, you can stay, you know, stay happy and live uh, your life out in this village and play chess and, uh, sports and, and checkers and, and there's, uh, but there's one big thing that's done to your identity when you're in this village. Yes. Everybody gets a number assigned to him and he is assigned number six. No names. His and, name is never mentioned. Although, um, and you can't get out of the village no matter what you do. There's, and, and there's one of the security things is this thing called Rover and Rover is what makes this show kind of like take a leap out of, 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 uh, of all the other shows at the time. It's basically a weather balloon. And like they had like a big monster. Yeah, it's a monster. giant white weather balloon. But the way they operate it and make it and they put these sound effects to it, it is creepy as all get out. It's in the it's in the opening credits and like what they have is this like slow motion water bubble effect that's supposed to be the birth of Rover or Rover coming out as the security. That's one of those, those uh, lava lamps. It's yeah. Like, you know, basically, like a, it, you know, it kind of evokes that period again. Again, it accidentally or intentionally kind of evokes the lava lamps in the '60s and all this, you know, the psychedelica, you know, going on. And this, this the is... other, the other cool, the clerical thing. I, I mean, I've never seen any of uh, um, Danger Man or anything, but um, it's clear like the filmmaking is ambitious. If not, it's still TV, so it's is quick run and gun. And there's, but it's like they try, they go, go, they take some big swings in this. Well, this is now going back to something I think you said earlier. McGowan, uh, he's kind of he's kind of burnt out doing John Drake, the Secret Age, uh, Danger Man. He's just uh-huh. like you know, another, you know, another, you know, just all, you know, how many different plots they can do and variations they can do. And a couple of episodes were shot at this place where the village is. It's an actual place in England called Port Marion. On Which Wales. they don't reveal until the last episode because they were worried people would like swarm it or something. Oh, well, yeah. yeah they, and plus, a, a commercial plug for it too. You know. Oh, because right? because it, it's title card in the last. Well, episode now it's is you know it's a it's an actual resort area. Now you can go there and, you, and there's a uh, souvenir shop you can buy prisoner stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a uh, but he a uh, couple issues a couple episodes of Danger Man were shot Port Marion and Magoon took note of it. He goes, "This is a, this is a really cool. Set. Mm-hmm. This would make something really cool." And then George Markston, the editor on the third season of Danger Man, had knew about the. He threw out this idea where the, up in Scotland there was this place where they would retire spies and, and let them relax and retrain them and and maybe extract stuff from them they they might need to know or get or whatever. And McGowan thought that was cool, even though isn't there a little bit of debate on who came up with the original? Well, idea or... well, yeah, that's a whole kind. Con- yeah, and and of course another one. Somebody else said, "Well, this is more obvious." McGowan's at a party sometime one night and. And he goes, uh, oh, well, what is this? Where does the spy go once he retires? He's referring mm-hmm. to what does McGowan do once he retires John Drake? Mm-hmm. And that's smart, maybe you know McGowan. Well, wasn't some of the filming or some of the crew treating it, treating it like a uh, like a Danger Man sequel? And there, there's some. I heard that there was a novelization where uh, you know. Number six never gets a name, but in the novelization they call him John Drake for well, even like the, the first opening passage. I think on the one of the call sheets or one of the tech sheets or something there was a d instead of p for the character mm-hmm. and george markstein if you watch the documentary on the 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 recent the, the blu-ray that came out on a really nice blu-ray came out on the whole series and with all some extras he flat out says it's john drake but the controversy is mcgowan denies it and it's probably it's just down to money and copyright and trademark if uh but it McGowan also, and it also makes to, a better story too yeah mcgowan would have to share uh the, all the creative, because I mean, Magoon took this over and smothered the thing, and his it became his baby, totally his baby, and uh, and and, it's, and uh, he would have to, uh, yeah, and and uh, but I think my mind, I I can't see why it's not John Drake. It's just it would make so perfect sense because John Drake also Magoon was a very Catholic person, very Catholic. He wouldn't kiss girls. He didn't want to handle a gun. He was offered James Bond. He turned it down. He was twice, a, right? A, a, possibly. And it was off of the Saint too. I, I was just reading. Turned that down. Uh, so 
and I was watching some of the extras last night, and then there was like one scene where he's supposed to kind of kiss this girl in the, the village. They pretend that there's something going on with her. He wouldn't do it. And of course, the the guy, uh, one of the production managers, saying, "I can't believe this really good actor, and he, and he, and he for a sense of acting, he can't do that." But McGowan had some, had some really interesting uh, uh, morality ticks. Uh, it, it affected his uh, what he picked and the acting and stuff. I read that he won some Emmys for Columbo, but he like because he wrote some Columbo episodes. He directed, and, he, directed he, he acted and directed at Columbo. I, I forgot. I wanted to watch those at those yeah, since those everyone really, on film yeah. Twitter loves Columbo right now. But um, did he ever? Nothing he did matched this, right? And no, it, after this, nothing he did, before. He, after. he did a he did a, 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 a series. I think it was on NBC. Rafferty. It was a hospital. Uh, he played a, probably like probably what uh, uh, Hugh Laurie was. Is it a Hugh Laurie house? House. I mean, but uh, he's he playing. Uh, that and he uh that it didn't, it, didn't, uh, it got canceled or it didn't well, did he have creative control over that no i don't think uh i don't think he was and of course he was a he was a hard person to get along with i mean if you read the stories about the production of course he was under the gun money and and time and and uh you know he'd drive he'd, people would quit and people would get upset and leo mulkern had a nervous breakdown <laughs> and uh so yeah he was an interesting person uh, I think somebody saw him in a restaurant one time and walked up to him and just wanted to say, hey, I really love your, your person. And, uh, and he basically said F off, you know, to him. <laughs> Pulled so, uh, Alec McGinnis uh, on a Star Wars man. <laughs> yeah. And he, people were just bugging him. But apparently when uh, we talked about how the episode he ends, he escapes. We needed, well, I guess we'll get into the last episode, but he got phone calls. Uh, the, 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 the switchboard was just, uh, people were pissed off at the end. And he had to leave. He left. He actually disappeared for a little bit just because people were so upset at the end. Well, okay. Well, let's go into a little bit of uh, at least how my newbie reaction to the series because we, you, when we we set up to do this, you, what your one request was that you you and I sit and watch the last two episodes together. And I said to you after we finished that, besides the fact that the last two episodes, mainly the last episode, the second to last episode, I kind of thought was had a chamber plane vibe to it that a uh, kind of a Brechtian thing that was fine, but interesting and kind of odd in a good way. But that last episode was the mind blower. Um, but I said to you, man, I just wish I was sitting with someone who liked this throughout the whole thing. Just like talk, talk me through what I should be paying attention to. And like, okay. So this was originally devised as a mini series that you want to, well, I could actually I could help you on this because I was t- checking that last night and this morning. Uh, they were going to do 13, ep- uh, 13 episodes for season one, and that's UK, BBC, uh, ITC. Sir Lou Grade, ITC were behind this. And, uh, you know, uh, England has weird episode counts. Lou Grade's trying to sell this to America. They said, well, you know, they want 26 episodes for a season. I mean, that's how many episodes were a season back mm-hmm. then, 26 to 30 or whatever. And uh, Lou Gray goes, oh, you know, uh, and they said, and then America this was, was America was in uh, the American networks were not too hot about because they they looked at it as a series. And this guy loses every episode. Hmm. This guy loses. I mean, what, who who wants to watch this? So Lou Gray said, well, can I bump it? Uh, we'll make it a summer replacement. So seventeen episodes fits a summer replacement. So they decided to uh, uh, tell McGowan, can you do four more and we'll wrap it up. So there's, uh, and there's in the four episodes they did, uh, really quick. McGowan wrote the final episode, by the way, in 36 hours. You I think that. I heard something like that. So they, uh, so the, so that's where it's that's continue your your episode count. Uh, so that so now Lou Grade knows. Okay, we're going to do 17 episodes. So we got it sold to America for a summer replacement, the CBS, and that's and then you're done. You know, we're over over with it. Um, to to your point earlier about why this works, and I agree with you, the ending is why it works, and the fact that it has an ending. I was thinking of David Simon famously said that one of the problems with almost all of the art form of TV is that whenever you're creatively coming up with it, you come up with a beginning, you maybe come up with a middle, but you never come up with an end because you want it to keep going. And and Alan Moore really specifically said that the fact that he's, he had the same reaction too. He was just like, you know, Alan Moore famously has some pretty notable endings and he said that was one of the formative things for him the two things he said he got from the prisoner was that you need to have a satisfying ending and he also talked about the 
difficulty in art and the reward once you've accessed that difficulty, um, which some of these episodes are brainy and, and kind of obtuse in certain ways. And I was, but like, it's, it's, I, I, it's a modern phenomenon too that would like come up with a beginning and into a season now that a lot of shows have endings or are allowed to have endings. And then your wheels turn in the middle. There are some middle episodes where the ones where it's like, oh, these are the hard ones to get through. And there's something, about, there's something to be said about this uh, being tight and concise. I think uh, if there's any criticism in this great period of TV we're in now is, you know, how 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 much do you drag it out? You know? Right, uh, and, right. you know, yeah, you can give these supporting characters uh, all the nuances you want now, where our supporting character in a two-hour movie doesn't get maybe one line. Well, we get we have all our great filmmakers going to TV right now, and a lot of them say, like, we mentioned James Gunn's next thing after Suicide Squad is a spinoff, Peacemaker, then he, and he, he amongst, like, other filmmakers will say, like, we can ha- live in character moments. We can extend character moments. It's not momentum to the third act and like wrap it up in two hours. Yeah. And I think another, uh, well, I, I was going to say, I have another little weird theory that could be blasted out of the water, but, uh, you know, well, I'm curious cause I might want to blast it out of the water. <laughs> well, uh, it's really broad stroke, but, uh, t- you know, the history of TV, mm-hmm. uh, uh, television, you know, you basically, uh, especially in America, it's a commercial driven. It was, com- you know, it was mm-hmm. networking. You, you said it earlier. I, I was, I was about ready to comment on your idiot box. It was called. Right. Now there was, now there was live TV in the fifties. There was this, you know, highfalutin where Frankenheimer and, and, uh, Lamette came the, from the play direct the play things. And, you know, Patty the, high, you, 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 yeah, there was some, you know, there's some of that there, but you know, it wasn't, but you know, it, we end up, you know, with a pretty much of a TV wasteland or what do you want to call it, for a long period of time. I mean, and I and I don't want to. I know people go, well, Dick Van Dyke, Mary Tyler Moore, all in the family. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, I mean, but uh, you know, there was certain codes and certain things, and, and and everything was commercial driven by money, and and you and you had a structure to follow because you had to go to every fifteen minutes to go to a break. It's part of the reason, like, I wanted to give your pick this just because, like, we were going over the list and we couldn't figure the prisoner was at the top of it, like anybody's list. But it feels like this is one of the most intelligent things that was put on the air. On, on network TV, at least, yeah. before, like, what, Hill Street Blues or something? Or, I mean, not counting PBS or Monty Python. Or, yeah, there's always exceptions. There's like a lot said, of exceptions. So there's broad. a lot of exceptions. This is so broad, broad but I, uh, I want to say that uh, until we got to cable and HBO and, ca- and ca- cable television where all of a sudden you could do uh, things without worrying about the, uh, that it, or we're going to, you know, sell cornflakes for this thing or whatever. Uh, all, all bets were off and you could do these wonderful things that we're in the midst of right now. We're getting at such an overload of them. Uh, I almost want to, in my comparison, I was uh, almost with him that with comic books, you had the, you know, the comic books code comes in and there's a long just period of just nothing. Comic books are just, you know, dulled and, and neutered. And there's, of course, there's always exceptions. The direct sale market comes in. And then all bets are off on the comic books because you can. You do, think the direct market is a, I, is a boon, create a boon to the comics? Uh yeah, because you could you could create some you could you could uh, aim something at a certain audience, print up, up that so many, and you and you make your money, and you don't have to worry about you know it, it bombing. Um, uh, yeah, but I mean, uh, well, I, I, know I said this no, is, no, no. I I like it just because well, one of the things I wanted to point out that was most distinct to me is like the central theme of the prisoner to me is uh, about uh, against conformity. And I was hearing someone talk the other day about how once we were no longer limited to the three networks, conformity is not something most modern people worry about anymore yeah. just because right. we're, we're faced with lots of uh, intellectual diversity at the exactly. very least. There's, exactly. a, you know, there's too much TV to watch. There's so many ideas so out on the internet. market. There. You kind of, kind of agree with what I'm kind of going at. Yeah, I, I see it. Yeah. yeah. I, haven't well, for, I, haven't, I, haven't, I haven't tweaked it. Well, the structure of network TV always you know, was mainly episodic. You'd have usually an A, B, C story. Your A and B story were usually week to week and your C story may be the only thing that was serialized that kind of went across seasons, but it was meant to, if you missed episodes, and then that kind of changed in the late 80s. I think uh, um, Wise Guy was a famous show that did it. Uh, doesn't Crime Story, is it not serialized? Or? Yeah, it, there's yeah, there's an interesting continuity going on. And then that, I, and I was trying to also think of comparable shows. And that, an interesting ending, too. For me, that okay. Yeah. Uh, I still haven't seen it. Um, uh, comparable shows that blew my mind at a similar age and uh, that I wonder how they age. And I think mostly age well. For me, is Buffy the Vampire Slayer. 
and that was a that was a key serialized show. That was the one that just like took serialization, and just went straight yeah. for it. And that there's an argument that that along with a few other shows really pushed peak TV to like start connecting stories. And even though Buffy didn't necessarily have an ending in mind at the beginning, more shows started to like come in mind just because the finales were. There's so many finales that bomb. Like I mentioned, Battlestar Galactica and Lost earlier. Those shows lost their reputations on their ending and maybe the prisoner has its reputation on a weak middle but god what an ending yeah and 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 even the weak uh episodes there's so there's you know uh i would i would challenge you to say even the ones that are kind of bonkers they, they you got some you got yeah you, you, you they cherry picked wonderful british actors to show up we should say that when he's in the village okay so he's abducted in the village and so every episode he's up against a number guy number number two and of course Number six, Magoon wants to see number one. He wants to get out of the village. He uh, he has at the end of the opening, uh, who is number one? Uh, you are number six. Yeah, uh, and he uh, wants to. Uh, so so it's the job of number two to break him down, to break him down, find out why he resigned. And every episode, uh, the number two usually fails, and uh, but but number six doesn't get away either. So uh, so the next episode you watch, all of a sudden it's a different number two. So in other words, they're just revolving these guys out. They keep on the or whatever organization is running this, and that's the that's a, that's the cool thing too. Is like it pointed out that we're in the midst of the Cold War when the series is out. Mm-hmm. It's throwing out the idea that the other side is just the same as our side, mm. and you know, in fact, somebody pointed out one of the guys that says it's too bad that they didn't they didn't put a uh, uh, a non UK number two in there uh another white uh a non-white british they uh they had a female number two yeah um but, but you're saying like a russian number two or or yeah just you know out of germany or, or an african-american yeah, number African-American, two? yeah they've been really they've really been Be- preloaded yeah. yeah but anyway but it, that you know the, and so and then at, at some point he's being bombarded by the number twos but at some point uh the episode start he's starting to be more aggressive and taking it to them, right? Uh, so there's a little bit of a, a sea shift in the series, uh, but uh, so and again, you got this, you got this wonderful set. Oh, uh, go ahead. Uh, well, well I, I think so. What was your reaction overall? Well, yeah. you when I was in the early episodes, I mean, it's a very clear setup, and like it's the first episode where the or first or second episode where two like there's the clear changing of guards between number twos, right? It's the end of the yeah. first episode. I was pretty few far into. I started realizing, oh, they're different number twos every week. Really? Just yeah. well, just because I wasn't keeping up with the actors, yeah. and then in the very middle, I just started like when they started getting into some of the wonkier episodes, I was lost. I'm like, wait, was this a number two plot to get information out of this, or is it just some kind of weird thing that happened to him this <laughs> week? The the episode where they he had the trial and he was yeah. in the newspaper. That right. was one where I was like. Where does number two's uh, task end and begin, and when does the next number two take over? Is it just in between? Well, episodes? there's like there's you know the whole point is like is there's like there's really like psycho psychoanalysis. Uh, uh, play with your brain. Uh, Speaking of the spy phenomenon, I thought there was a lot of Manchurian Candidate in this. Too. Yes. Oh yeah. Very much so. It's not. It's. It, it is not. I mean, there's some fist fights. You know, McGowan threw in fist fights, uh, oh, yeah. and, and uh, so that you could uh, appease some of the audience. But uh, there's yeah. also there's also the phenomenon which when we watched this yesterday, you were like, "Ah, oh, that blue ray looks good." And like these things were broadcast often in black and white, but also in um, analog and in a SD, and were not meant to see been, be seen multiple times. So now, when you get these really crisp, crisp new transfers of, I guess this would have been shot in 35, like. It's just it's just the technique of the time, the sophistication technique. But you see, I mean, you're not going to have digital replacements on faces. You just see stunt doubles very easily. Oh yeah, I mean, and it's almost all TV shows, uh, pretty much up until about now, or just like the last ten, fifteen years, where they actually those digital replacements became. With those needed. helicopters flying off near the end, you get they, they you pretty... you commented on that. I, I was just like, I'm into it. I'm fine with it. It's like <laughs> I, it's there's a lot of like the, 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 there's something homemade uh, oh no 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 i mean that yeah. is fun about the, again yeah. it goes back to the home run swings i thought in the filmmaking where i mean the rover half the rover shit is just the, the sound effects are doing so much work for it even though right. it's such a go- well okay it's not just that it's the shot um when you get rover would trap number six when the, his face that's a pretty yeah. 
like that's got to be a searing sh- image it's, to see when you're a kid. It's like it's like a, a giant bubblegum uh, is over your face. Uh, I, I should stretched bri- over your face. I should briefly mention you've never seen it, but I watched only the pilot just this week of the uh, modern remake of The Prisoner, starring uh, <sighs> yeah, E. McKellen, yeah. Jim Caviezel, Haley Atwell, um, and you know your love of the number two concept, the revolving guest star. E. McKellen is the top line actor on the show because he is a permanent number two. And it's only a six episode thing. And I only watched the opening and it was not for me, let's just say. Well, um, you know, here I, 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 I'm, I, I'm sort of embarrassed, but I'm also sort of like relieved that I haven't, but I haven't watched it. I, I, I bought the, I have the box set sitting on a shelf and I'm just like, it got such, it got such, so, so, so trounced. And I, and I love, it know, got really bad reviews. Well, you mentioned that he wasn't necessarily a spy. The show really goes to links to not tell you what it was. He was like the way he resigns is like, he spray paints resign on his window and it's cut in a very oblique modern way. So, and then it builds towards, um, the final line of the, of the first of the pilot is the final line of the original sequence. I am not a number. I am a free man. Yeah. McGowan, you know, it started out, like I said, he had marks, he had most of the Danger Man crew with him when they started out. It was a handshake with Sir Lou Gray that they do the series. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't even you know, a final, he didn't sign a piece of paper for it. But, you know, Lou Gray didn't want to lose his high, the, the high, the big star. He didn't want to lose McGowan. So he let McGowan do this. Uh, and uh, who was the story editor? Because didn't he leave after the That's George first... Marston. That's he, the one I... Is he the one who left after thir- the first cycle, 13 episodes? Yeah. And when things got kind right. of. Right. And he, uh, and he, and he he's... got interesting after that point. I mean, I. I yeah. I... Well, yeah. And again, that's why I think McGowan kept on taking more on more on responsibilities and, 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 and discarding people that were uh, directors and he would fire directors. And well, was other. he working under a pseudonym up until the last two episodes? So, uh, a lot of times there were a lot of pseudonyms in there. Wow. And, um, uh, and uh, he, you know, he, I think he really just got caught up into the whole phenomenon of this and how, making it, you know, his baby. And he, you know, people go, you know, want to know, know, it would bug him forever. And he says, you know, if I told you the answers, why would you want to be engaged in watching this? You know, he, he, he purposely wants it to be uh, too and vague, you know, and, and there, and there's so many different fans. Like another interesting uh, tangent on this is Mel Gibson wanted to do a remake. Oh, we have an oh, and or the Christopher Nolan remake that um, uh, was it David Peoples wrote that okay. was Christopher Nolan was really close to doing this. Yeah, there's a, uh, there's I think there's certain generations of people that really you know like love this thing and just want to, and and Gibson wanted to do Avengers too, but and he wanted to do a, a Prisoner, and Gibson. Uh, of course, uses McGowan in uh, Braveheart. Right, right, right. You know, uh, and That's where I knew McGowan through for forever. Yeah, and Time to Kill. Remember the uh, he's a judge. And, uh, I don't. I re looked up Scanners and remember. Oh, and yeah. a lot of it is like watching this. Like it's kind of like the William Shatner phenomenon. You know, William Shatner has been famous for his entire acting career after Star Trek. But when you go back to the original series of Star Trek, you forget how like young and pretty he looked. Yeah, McGowan. Well. And uh, Magoon w- worked with Wells on Moby Dick Rehearsed. Yeah, and, and, and Orson Wells has some really, like he said, like he was one of the most best stage presence he'd ever seen in an actor. And I want to, you know, I, a couple things uh, about that is that, and I think I threw this out to you originally, and I, I don't know if you were online with me on this or not. The editing style of this show, it just seems like it has a very unique uh briskness to its editing no it's and i it, almost it, want to say it's like or it's wellsian editing and, i can see it i can uh, see it well there's also just like like uh french new wave into america like richard lester stuff there's stuff that appeals to you a lot i yeah, think because like, well, it, it can be very choppy in in hectic too but at the same time like i've I mean, always wanted to sit down try to maybe if i can analyze this and articulate it but I, there's some you always say what, it's like move on the action and i don't think that's it yeah it, there, yeah yeah everybody says move on the action but wells there's something about Wells. When I watch a Well Orson Wells films, it's just the editing just has this. It just gives me this. I have a different uh, reaction to it. And you then, can you can almost see in like other side of the wind what sections he did and didn't edit. Right, and then I get the same sim, similar sense in The Prisoner, and I'm just wondering. If, and or and McGowan is a very intense actor, and Wells can be a very intense actor. Uh, uh, highs and lows, and 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 moderating the voice. So I think McGowan took a lot from Wells. And then I wonder, 
uh, uh, this, we we will get to the final episode at one point, but I just he, there's a there, there is a one scene in the, in the final episode. He takes a little globe, a glass globe, and throws it and shatters on the floor. Uh-huh. And I'm thinking, you know, Rosebud, you know, oh. the beginning of Citizen Kane, and then he throws it at the final episode. He, well, it's not a snow globe, but it's a globe. No, I get it. Yeah. So anyway, I, 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 I might be just non uh, something else. But. Everything's a reference to Citizen yeah. Kane. One of the things about Maguin that was clear, was very charming to me is like, because uh, at well said that like uh, he's, he thought he was a great stage presence, but he, he's, he lamented that he's been lost to TV. And Maguin had TV uh, leading man moves. Like he's very angular in the way he moved. He, you clear he was very perceptive of how the camera one of my favorite things about his face is like his his eyebrows are so blonde it feels like they're not there so it's like he's all brow and yeah. like but he would always like look down so like the brow was pronounced so you can see the expression of how his brow is and it, it just and a big forehead but By the way, an expressive I, forehead yeah uh keep that in mind later we're gonna we'll have some that, specifically the brow and the forehead but we'll, we'll keep going why for no. the finale no it's just a different tangent on the prisoner uh you'll see uh, okay i'll keep yeah. that <laughs> Mine, um, I do, but I, 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 I really, I, I, you know, there's, there's these actors that you just enjoy to watch, and 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 he's, he's and, a joy to watch. And looks right, and, and he's just so fun because he's so intense and he, the movement and so angry, like you said, and uh, when he, you know, he show when he goes to the village, he's in this black suit, and I just love that black outfit, and then the village outfits are pretty cool too. They're kind of funky. Uh, they have this weird outline on the lapel, yeah, on the lapel and stuff. But then he gets, they put him back in the black outfit at the end. You know, I just love. You uh, you laughed when that happened when we were watching, it, and it took me a second to realize, oh, he's in a different outfit. But it's obviously that was his original. Yeah, and uh, yeah, they, they actually, you know, they they when he succeeds to get the scene number one, and at the end, they ask him, "We thought you might be comfortable in your your your." your yeah, and they and, they, and they, they put, actually they, a, they put that mannequin, mannequin that, that like a, does not that like uh, it, it's it's kind of not horrifying but it's like the face is like uh yeah. melted in a way like okay going to the opening and where he's wearing his original suit like uh the other thing i always think about the filmmaking this time and like just how they're figuring stuff out is how over 80 yards certain things like the steps like you, you i always think of uh of uh point point blank the steps and point blank oh, yeah, but right. those are non-diegetic this <laughs> is like it just yeah, and the swing and the swinging of the light, the noir swinging of the light. Whenever like he comes in and out of the shadow to go, you goes to it, the light swings, it goes to black, and then they go to the close up of them. Yeah, right. The beginning of the opening where he's going to go resign. Yeah, there's there's just so much fun to watch in this, and like I said, it. I think you see that it's one that you can go back to and back to and pick. Up. I was even watching the last two episodes with you the other night. I was like, wow, I'm I'm seeing you know, uh, I'm. I'm thinking about some other things that I didn't think about, you know, individuality and, you know, uh, 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 and, uh, like, uh, freedom and, uh, right. uh the, the juxtaposition of violence and, uh, the, the, the summer of love that just had happened. Well, that's seven. pretty big in the last episode. Yeah. Are, are we ready to jump into this last episode? Cause the last episode, like, look, <laughs> the, the, the crazier thing to me about the whole show, even when I was like, I'm not sure I'm getting this. I, I knew it was good. That was what was frustrating. It was like, I know this is good. I'm just not engaging with it. I and mean, it's, it's creative as all get out. And it's clearly defying anything that was being made at the time. It's a little, I mean, as, a, as of anything, it's a, it might be a little squeaky, uh, and, and Squeaky's so, a good word. I like that. At some points, you know, just because it's in 1967, they're shooting in 67, 68, and it airs in 68, 69, and it, it just, you know, it's, uh, but I think there's so much to just uh, the munch on. You take a, you, a knife and fork and, and to dive into it. It's a full course salad, you know, with all kinds of, you know, different flavors to check out and, and, and understand. And again, just, let, let's uh, repeat the fact that basically, so so for uh, fifteen episodes, he's battling these n- different number twos in the village, trying and he's and they they really do a number on him. Like sometimes they actually take him, they actually take him out of the village, all the way to London. That was I pointed to you. That was part of the point where it's like, how many goddamn times did he get uh, go to back to the mainland? And, and 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 they actually and then they just yank him back, you know, at the last. Second. And sometimes it would be like the the one particular episode which start out so well when he went back. You're it's like, birthday, oh, the birthday one where he says his birthday. I think so. It's yeah. the it's uh, where they pinpoint the village is in like northern Africa yeah. and like it and the setup to get him back is like you can see a mile away. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it, so it's a lot of fun. So, and then, uh, uh, before we get to the last, basically talk about the last two in a way, 
so the last four, uh, one is interesting. The one that you thought was really wonky, and everybody, even the writer on the documentary says, "I wrote this." They they kept they said, "Can you write this?" McGowan's off shooting a film. Oh, okay, yes. Can you write this? And you have, there's no McGowan in it and no Port Marion in it, and it's like. Well, that's not a prisoner episode, you, right? You, I mean, the whole thing about P- prisoner is it's Port Marion and Pri- and McGowan. so he has to write this episode with a brain transfer. Well, they and- set it up in the most ridiculous way, where they said say like, um, oh, it's a it's an espionage technique where we can insert our own spy into another body. You switch a body, yeah. You, su- you switch, switch bo- body, dead and, man. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and but you send a spy into another country, having switched the body, and you're like, you can get your own person in there. You send a spy or someone who has motives that you want to accomplish in there. You don't send someone who is your prisoner who's yeah. like wants to escape and and let him free. And and, and Nigel Stock, they picked Nigel Stock uh, uh, to play him. And yeah, and the writer says it's not a good. I, I don't like it. I I I I'm I'm not proud of it. And then they they when Magoon got back from shooting uh, the movie, Magoon's all it's in I, I Station Zebra. That he was shooting. Well, yeah, and I was going to say something about that too. Oh, but he, uh, his voice is throughout the episode. Uh, right, and so Magoon comes back and he says, "Oh, he didn't like it. Well, he didn't like he wasn't too happy with it." So they rejiggered it and reshot it and messed the rhythm. And he and the writer goes, "Well, you know, it wasn't that good of a script in the first place, and." Is now just a, another a different, not a good script <laughs> in the second place. Yeah, you, and, you, yeah. You just they didn't they, they didn't fix it. it one is, of the things it, whenever you work in film, you're, you're are you familiar with the term zebra? It's a horse by committee. Yeah. So it didn't. It, uh, so even the, when the writer says that, it, you know, it's it's a kind of a wonky episode. But I, I always the funny thing about it is I want to say about Oxygen Zebra. Uh, I, I recommend to you if you if you get caught up watching Danger Man episodes and and, and the Prisoner. Also watch Our Station Zebra because McGowan shows up as a British secret agent mm-hmm. and he never we never get to know his real name. <laughs> so I'm thinking it's 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 Drake. It's the it's it's another, it's one of his missions. Didn't, you know? didn't he play um uh, a, a British secret agent on Broadway in the eighties? Like he he played a lot of British agent or secret or spy. I don't agent. know about that. Okay. Uh, I'm not, I'm I, I thought I'd write up that it was one of his last like a stage. It may not have been Broadway, but it was in New no. York. I thought I'm, I'm surprised they have you know thought of a Broadway musical version of The Village or something. <laughs> you know, like, we're trying to escape number two. I am not a number. Uh, yeah, I am I'm a free a man. <laughs> Here comes Rover. Rover's coming over. <laughs> so. <laughs> I think we got something there. Maybe we should work on that. Uh, anyway, we'll get to the last. Let, let's let's not use any names so we can retain the rights, and I'll, I'll edit this part of the episode. <laughs> exactly. But uh, so I I had to wait. I wanted to watch the last two. The last two were kind of a, a, a two pieces. Even though the the second one is shot, it was the sixth one shot. Yeah, you because because there's a setup. You had to point it out to me, but uh, number two has to be is has a completely different haircut and shaving in the second episode because they shot it so uh, different parts. So he brings Leo McKern back. He's uh, he had already been in one episode, one of the reoccurring two, and they acknowledged that he'd been um uh back and they and he wants to do absolute deg- uh, abs- uh, degree absolute, and that was the actual original name of the episode. Okay, uh, and then but they they changed the fallout. Uh, and it's me. It's McCurran decides. Look, one of us. I'm going to lock him in this room at a certain time period. Well, once upon a time is a second to last episode, right? And follow. Oh, up that's right. Episode. I'm sorry. They changed the once upon a time. You're right. I'm okay. sorry. Uh, um, sorry, I didn't mean to throw you off. Uh, no. Uh, then, but so it's McCurran, It's it's basically comes down to this one. Uh, it's like a like you said a Breckian play. Uh, a one on one McGowan and uh, very very surreal. So yeah, and uh, a very abstract. So and so, it gets very. Well, they try. It's abstract. There's a period where it's like going through a, a, an average person's childhood. Yeah, and with abstract uh, elements, they're just like a a, 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 a seesaw. Uh, they're on a sawhorse. That's a, a bomber in the World War Two. Oh yeah, and things like that. And um, oh, we should we, we should mention. Uh, there's no uh, so there's no reoccurring cast except for one character, the butler. Uh, and he doesn't talk. This is and, he, and he's uh, he's uh, what's the proper term? A little people. Uh, sure. A uh, little person. Sorry, I can't help you there. Uh, but uh, he uh, he and he and uh, he's throughout all the episodes, and he's in the room with them. And then the last two episodes has the final certain characters come back. Yeah. Uh, then uh, and then there's a there's a reoccurring guy called Supervisor. The one takes him and puts him in a suit. Uh, you see him. He's he's in. The the, the original the, the original uh, organization he worked for that that's in the credits. They're in like a one or two episodes, right? 
uh, I don't think so. I think uh, they they keep on calling it the general, the colonel. They get they keep on they didn't get stay consistent with that. Okay. Um. So uh. Anyway, so they basically one of them is going to have to die, and McKern loses, and he dies. And he dies in a very weird, odd way. Yeah, odd um, way. Yeah, we don't know. I mean, again, all of a sudden you're not like all of a sudden the questions are starting to pile up now. It's getting really kind of weird. I mean, you can kind of like. It seems to be somewhat grounded, but now we're getting into some weird territory. Well, we f- forget to mention that uh, the, the two more episodes that get really weird. The girl who was death. Oh, the, I love that episode yeah. until the end. Yeah, the Napoleon thing, and then, uh, and then the uh, there's a Western episode. Yeah, and all of a sudden it, it opens up as a Western, and uh, it it kind of has a Westworld few years before Westworld vibe. Oh, right. The, oh, the girl who was death. I mentioned this on our episode about uh, um, uh, all that jazz where Jessica Lange plays death in there. And I was like, oh, that must be a precursor to Neil Gaiman's death. And this beats that by like a decade, <laughs> even though she's not really death. She's, yeah. But her name's death and she's a very cute girl yeah. who's death. And uh, so uh, the episode ends with uh, the, the supervisor comes out and says, hey, what do you want? What do you want? Uh, you, you, uh, you, McCur- uh, this number two is dead. And he goes, I want to see number one. So we opened up with, uh, the last episode fallout. I want to, I keep wanting to come back to this. Like you watch this when it aired in the summer and you were nine, nine years old. God. And I, I have never forgotten it. It, it just, it blew my little nine year old mind. Um, cause the thing is this episode is up there and especially you were telling me like the Western episode didn't air because they were like, I, when you explained it to me, why? Cause it was supposedly has this anti-violence de- thing and they couldn't put, uh, Vietnam, anti-Vietnam sentiments out there. And it's like, you go from someone who just says, Oh, shooting someone's bad. And like, we can't air that to this. Yeah. Well, actually I found out now, I, I think that was always been the myth about the Western episode that CBS wouldn't air it because, uh, we're in the middle of Vietnam. It was a passive, very pacifistic. Uh, okay. Uh, theme in the Western episode, very past because he wouldn't. Right. And but it uh, turns out that I think the reason, really reason, the has uh, a hallucinogen. Uh, how do you say the word? Hallucinogen. Uh, well, drugs that caused him to think he's in the West. Oh, that's what they were. Really? So the Western episode, when Western coach <laughs> shows are the one of most popular things on the air, they're okay. They have a problem airing that. But when they go to those last two episodes, yeah. that's that's not hallucinogenic enough for exactly. them. Exactly. Yeah, it's hilarious. But oh. yeah, for some reason that they didn't air the Western episode when they first aired it, because the whole show. I can't say this enough. This feels like the birth of the mythology show and like a uh, long-term serialized, you know, you mentioned comics earlier. Comics were another reason that went into more serialized TV. Kind of a lot of comic book readers sort of come into that. But this ending in, in this, like a lot of mythology shows will like, because they're going so long, will do some very Damon Lindelof from creator of lost and uh, leftovers, not creator, co-creator. He's a showrunner, the leftovers. They have some bizarre stuff in there. In between a very mythologized, logic, left brain, plot driven stuff, but you have these like segues into like this also feels like the birth of Twin Peaks too. Just like these really surreal, like you can do surrealism as long form. And right. It's, well, good. I'm glad. At least you got. At least. Oh you, no, you the got, ending yeah. was. Yeah. Oh, that so, is... so the ending saved it for you, basically, or kind of told you. Well, you know, it, it, it's a combination of like it was. It was really gonzo and all there but also what you were saying earlier it's an ending yeah. like and part of my problem was just like how much longer do i have to go like these wheel spinning is like these seems like padding episodes so yeah so we so we wait uh so they the supervisor takes him to this big room uh even notice they kept on getting going lower and lower and lower in the village uh because uh sure they even went lower to the room where number one is i mean it's like they're up and uh but of course they had to, they, they were a housing, uh, we're going to spoil this. So if you haven't, if you, uh, we've spoiled so much already. Yeah. We've spoiled a lot here, but we're going to really spoil this episode. But basically there's a nuclear warhead, <laughs> it's a silo in this compound. 
And I, I was re- listening. I was reading Alan Moore's reaction. He was talking about uh, talking to his friends and like the newspaper woman, woman selling newspaper uh, the the day after the ep- last episode aired, and they were talking about theories. And the newspaper woman thought that um, because this missile goes up, she thought it was a rocket. She's like, she confirms number one's an alien. <laughs> well, I mean, that's the, you can go. I mean, that's the beauty of this episode. And and where did it, where did it fly to? Where did it, what did it do? Where An- they, another village, uh, uh, or or it had to go mean, to well, a, to get to the real ending. It had to go to a more centralized part of the planet where yeah. it can really. Well, there's it, a, there's another thing I need to tell you about. Uh, it journeys this, to the center of the uh, earth. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the uh, so uh, so he's he is awarded he, either he can become the leader of the village, or he can go free. And they give him money and passports and all this stuff. And there's this tribunal judge who we saw uh, the actor playing the Napoleon and the lady that was death. He's playing this wonderful judge. I think it's Kenneth McKellen. I don't know what he's a wonderful actor, uh, just perfect for this judge. And there's this tribunal sitting next behind him, and they're wearing the, uh, the half black, half white face mask with, with a, kook, a KKK. I really ha- I thought about Star Trek episode. Uh, Let that be your yeah. last battlefield. Oh yeah, yeah. The, or you know Steve Ditko, uh, uh, white is white, black is black. You know, sure. The, the Anne Rand uh, uh, objectivism. And each uh, this tribunal has got they're all representing different things of you know individualism, uh, marketing, uh, whatever uh, espionage. You know they have these little placards on their uh, uh, in front of them sitting there, and when they invite uh, number two, I mean they, they invite uh, Magoon up to talk and say, "Would you please address us? Mm-hmm. Please, we want to hear your words." And he starts to talk. This is where this one of the new things I, I caught watching it this time. They're all, they won't let them, they won't, they drown them out going, I, I, I. Well, that's the I, thing. I, 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 when I saw it, I thought they were reject, they were objecting because he started every sentence with I. Yeah. And they were just like, they didn't want him to say an I. They didn't want him to be an individual. Oh, I, okay. That's interesting. My take this Especially time. Especially because of when we get to the when number one really gets revealed. My take around this time is that they're so impressed by him. That he well, he has Everything accomplished. They say, he says that they like, don't care. They it's a typical of a celebrity or a hero where we don't really listen to him. The content, we, we just, we we're just, just like, celebrating. We just them. celebrate. We just go crazy. So they're just like going hi hi hi. They just they don't care what the heck he has to say, and he may be saying something very important. And the, the other thing about the tribunal's mass, where I went through like the Brazil Gilliam connection, is like they're deformed babies that are black and white. Too, yeah, they're, like, yeah, they're not ugly. They're not just a smooth uh, face. Yeah. Uh, Sometimes you can see a beard underneath them, and you. And again, it also makes face. me think of. I think I don't know if the, I, I got to look at the mouse again. Uh, the, uh, the 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 two theatrical masks. Oh, that definitely, definitely. Yeah, again, because of the theatrics of this whole thing, and they resurrect. Uh, then we have the young. We have two people come up, and they're on trial. And one is this, from the Western episode. Uh, is the, the, yeah, the actor person. who played in the Western? And I always wanted to think he's the same ca- character. Uh, I don't think you he know is. what else you haven't mentioned about the last episode. That's so cool. Beatles tunes. Oh well, or we, the yeah, music. Well, okay, yeah, but, yeah, we did get. We well, because Beatles that. are Beatles songs are never like uh, they want to know. Uh, there was said, a, there was a Mad Men episode that had um, I forget which Beatles song. It's uh, uh, one of the trippier ones on Revolver or the real groundbreaking trippier ones on Revolver. And Matthew Weiner said they had to blow like half the episode's budget just to get that one song. <laughs> Okay, well, since we're here, we'll we'll, we'll on to that, that Beatle thing. Yeah, you're right. It, it, you did not All hear. All you need is love. You never heard Beatle music forever and ever, and Beatle uh, and uh, different media, uh, mm-hmm. and, because there was a high, high price to pay, or they wouldn't even maybe you not even consider. I'm just surprised they they let it. And in. I think I read that just like everybody else in England, the four lads were watching The Prisoner. Okay, and they, they said, "Hey, it's just like." They were when they got when they said like when Hardy's night they said Richard Lester is going to be the director they said yeah because they had seen the running standing jumping film the Oscar nominated short that Lester had did uh-huh. and they wanted they wanted some like minds weren't they like goon fans too yeah and and, and goons and, and seen some of Lester's work so they go the, yeah perfect so they they probably now where the how much of a uh, a budget cut a price break they gave uh, Sir Lou Grade to use that song. But it's all you need is love, and the summer of '67 had just, uh, you know, had uh, happened. Summer of love. So when Magoon, when they're taking uh, Magoon down into the the tribunal area and the judging area and the, where everybody is at after he's put his uh, old uniform back on, his own clothing back on, there there's all these jukeboxes and they're all playing "All You Need Is Love" as he's walking down the or with the butler with them, mm-hmm. and it's just a weird 
you're just like, okay, we're in, we're in the restraint. But they don't, they don't use all you need is love, but they have some side songs that sound very Beatles-esque. The girl, um, the, the girl that was death episode, like that has a thing where they go into a record booth and there's like a Beatles pastiche in that episode too. So like, but I mean, just, they, yeah. So there's a song in there. Just, and oh. then later we're going to use that song as, uh, uh, uh as Jake's position, uh, Magoon and the, and these, uh, is these people that we're about ready to tell you about. They're mowing down people with machine guns, and they're that's playing, the real iconic. Usage. And they're playing "All You Need Is Love" <laughs> over a giant machine gun battle. And you know, here I, I was thinking, well, Magoo and Cap broke his little law of not killing people because he's actually shooting some of the people himself. I turned to you at some point. I think it was when Number Two died in the and um, uh, Once Upon a Time, and I was like, Has Magoo killed anybody in this entire in this? Entire no, series? I think I think he was kind of following his John Drake edict and and uh, and being uh, you know that he didn't mm-hmm. uh, kill. Uh, so. We get two representations. We get the hippie young youth, youth, and the, the actor who was in the uh, the young kid, the the young gunslinger kid in the, the ep- Western episode, Alex Kinner. He's back, and he is uh, he. And again, it's kind of funny. I also uh, it's it makes me think of Jack Kirby, which is going to play into this later. Always comes to Jack Kirby, uh, but uh, Jack's you know some of the people's ideal of what a hippie is gets when you're and they're they're in the middle age. They don't rep- the representation's a little wonky. So he's got this like top hat, a little. He looked like, like a droog. He, or an el- uh, oversized elf, uh, <laughs> and he's singing "Them Bones, Them Bones," and he go drives the tribunal crazy. But he's youth, and he represents the youth, and they're gonna. Uh, they can't. They they and there's a whole. I still don't understand why they're they're trying the youth either. Too, and then we get uh, the establishment, and they resurrect Leo McKern. And he represents the establishment where he gets his uh, shave and haircut. Yeah. Also, the, part of the resurrection is that he they, his hair color is different. And he gets a shave. Well, it's because McCur- uh, this is uh, this has been months between these two episodes were shot. Right. McCurran has done other movies and work and stuff, so they had to explain. But it actually fits. I think it actually fits well. It's part of the weird resurrection. I mean, they brought him back from the dead. Yeah. So I mean, no. why not just go crazy and make it? You know all these different elements may help to make him come well, back. the espionage trope of different faces. Too. Right. And so he's like going, Oh, I'm back. And, uh, and then he goes, Oh, you made it. Uh, you know, you, you succeeded. And, and, uh, but they go, he is, uh, he's, this is the establishment that actually re- revolts in his own way. And it causes trouble. So they're going to put him on trial. So we're going to put, we're going to, okay, we're going to suspend these two guys. And now we're going to talk to, uh, number six, uh, who's now one. And he goes, I want to see number one. He goes to see that they take him to the scene number one. Well, he, I mean, the, the two trials are they work as a metaphor, but then he goes yeah. to his real number one, and we see the real number one. Uh, yeah. Do we say it? I, I think. But, well, as well, well, first he pulls off. He goes and the guys dressed like the tribunal guys, the white, uh-huh. black man. He pulls the mask off, and it's a monkey mask. Uh huh. And so, he pulls one more mask. And off. then the, are you? And then you know that will make of that will watch you well. You, 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 there's theories about that. He pulls that mask off. Do we, do we say, dare say it? Yeah, it's McGowan. It's him. He is him. Well, and then there's like, I forget, is it before the shot or after the shot? It goes to number one, and the number one looks like an eye. The letter right. I. Big, yeah, and there's a... Going big, back to the tribunal, going I, I, I. That, yeah. was, that was where my brain went. Number one, I, the, uh, the, the, is it, and what is the big eyeball, the electronic eyeball? What is, who, is that, uh, is that the number one McGowan operating that, or is it something else? You know, there's just so many questions. It works in a way. It re- it really works in a really beautiful, swanky, strange way. But another, but it leaves so many. Uh, uh, and and the fe- the feeling of this episode is like it's such a surreal ending of a Bond movie, though, <laughs> like a Bond movie that goes into the id, like because because you really feel like everything's ending. This whole the village that you've been with for uh, seventeen episodes is going to blow up. Right. So he he uh, Magoon sees that there's a nuclear war. And there's a giant spaceship. Uh, Nuclear warhead. What do you? What call you? What have you? What do you? What do you? And he he just he sets it off, and it's and all of a sudden the the alert the alert, alert goes off. Desert the village. Get out. So everybody every there's five thousand helicopters flying out. Everybody's running for their life, and this thing's uh, up. And we see the death of Rover, with a, uh, a Carmen Miranda song. I I I I I love you very Ro- much. Rover I, just I I I I love you. Yeah, man. good point. So, Rover just kind of like sucks up. Yeah, into a lava pit. You know, just you just. You know, oh right. And 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 uh and, and then, and we were it, foreshadowing planting as Eric calls it as film class planting. Pass guess everybody. In once upon a time, the time they told us that this 
this in the in the room where Liam McCurry and McGowan were going one on one, there was a detachable trailer. There was a, depa- a detachable trailer, and uh, I didn't realize it until the, the last. And then episode. so all of a sudden, McGowan, uh, the kid, youth, the Liam McCurry, the establishment, the butler. Uh, detach. So everyone is. They go driving off in the trailer. Everyone escapes the village, mostly out of helicopters. Number one, out of a giant rocket that might be an alien spaceship. Well, do we? We don't know why the number one. We don't know. We really don't. There's a lot of we don't know. But um, the truck goes to civilization, even though someone drives by it. And it's again, I have that feeling. I'm I'm happy that there's an ending. This feels like an ending, but it's also like, dude, he's done this like three times. Or do we want to? Well, then, so the ending is the is, yeah. Well, uh, it's it's just, it's just, it's, so it's cool. wonderful because you got the kid gets off early and he starts thumbing or right. He's right. he's youth. He's he's free. He just he's gonna wing it, you know. Okay. Uh, then we get to London and there's Parliament, mm-hmm. and uh, number two is oh he's a member of Parliament. He's the establishment. He goes in and the next time we see him, he's all dressed up and he's waving. And he's going back into be into politics. This this, in, this last scene's also beautifully shot too because yeah. it's in you know they kind of I, I didn't get a permit either. They got a permit after the fact oh, they, that when they shot right. that stuff in London, and it has a really and the music and Magoo it talks to a cop and it's all done silence and mime. And I still don't understand what he was saying to the cop, yeah. but and uh, they leave it is they walk away from the. Uh, the trailer and he takes the butler and they're running across the street. They get back to his apartment and this as cars back ready to go for him. The same car that he drove off from. And uh, we see a hearse drive by. Yes. Ooh. But it, it's, and, it's not the same shot, but the hearse just kind of yeah. drives by in the and foreground. And then the butler is going to, I guess, stay with him. But as the butler goes into the house, the door electronically opens and closes just like with the same the, sound effect that his residence in the village did. All the, the, the doors did in the village. You asked if how I knew the ending. I think it was you who told me, but it was the circular um, that uh, it opens with the uh, beginning of the title credit sequence. Right, and then the first few shots, and then it. of course we open every episode with him in his car flying to your with camera. a thunder th- a thunderstorm uh, thunder sound, clap. a thunderclap, and then a, a shot, this really wide angle shot of this like runway with the car, his really distinct car driving center uh, center down the frame. Right, and that's how the series ends with that. Same shot. And so as a kid, I was just like, oh, he got away. I, the funny thing is, I don't think, uh, well, I don't know if I was smart enough at nine years old, but I I, I don't think I really caught the door doing that. Uh, and, 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 even if I did, I don't know if I was smart enough to go put that, maybe that together. I'm not sure. I just remember just thinking, he's gone, he's out, and he got away, and that's great. And the weirdness of it, c- coupled with the weirdness. I just I just thought this is the greatest thing in the world. In that Alan Moore interview, the interviewer used this word of a certain time, form of storytelling. I can't remember what the word was, but it was circular in that everything keeps resetting back to the place where it started. And so, like, yeah, it's obviously going to be the basis of um, network TV shows that are doing random show of the week versus. Um, and now the show has this really interesting structure where, like, it does episodic, it resets, but then the final episode resets everything again. So the circular structure is. Uh, two things we should mention too, just uh, just to throw in uh, uh, the weirdness. There's a symbol that keeps reoccurring in the end credits and in the uh, number two's uh, the bike, the bike, the penny farthing. I don't know. I mean, and yeah, uh, uh, some say you know it's like the penny farthing when it came out was a sense of uh, modern bicycling. But I, I, you know, I, read in, uh, I heard an interview where McGowan say progress and mainly technological process is the biggest problem of humans. Right. Human- it's it's and you know the bicycle is the start of that you know the, the beginning of you know, uh, uh, going to the you know horseless carriage and the, the car and the things like that and then uh, there's a couple different edits of of the uh, two first two episodes there's different edits with different music and different shots and the end credits end differently uh, the far thing turns into uh, the smaller wheel of the far thing turns into the globe the bigger wheel turns into the a uh, uh, shot of the galaxy and then the galaxy comes big. And then the word P.O.P. Com, uh, comes full screen out of that. P.O.P. P.O.P. Pop. No, I go. Uh, and and there's uh, there's and there's never really been a d- definitive explanation on that. But and, and they dropped it uh, and and just showed shots of the rover bubbling up out of the water. Then I think McGowan thought it was giving away too much. Like the think about it, if the nuclear warhead was going off at the end, 
Was it going to be the, uh, the apocalypse? Uh, uh, okay. the, 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 you know, the world is on its, it's, it's setting it uh, on its road to destruction. I think uh, it's going to pop. It's going to blow up. The you know a balloon. You know, I know. I, I mean, it's all kinds. No, of no. Of, I think one of the things that's so cool about this show is like that its pretensions like are good, like are ambitious. Yes. Like it's it's like, all these big swings it's doing. He's like, this is what society really is about in a mi macro and micro like. And it still applies to the day. A lot of things still apply to the day, even in this world, you know, this digital world we're, we're in. Uh, I don't think the surveillance stuff works as well. It's like, because I was trying, I tried to watch one behind the scenes doc and I was explaining like, oh, you know, there are cameras everywhere right now. I'm like, that's, that's kind of a, that, that ship sailed. Like that's there. You, you have to do more interesting stuff for that day, that topic to age well. Right. Um, I, that's just me. Right. Okay. Now let's get back to, I, I mentioned the, the brow and the forehead. Okay. Uh, I, uh, uh, there was some, uh, this writer, Steve Englehart, a comic book writer said, he remember thinking he saw, uh, Magoon and, and the prisoner thought, oh, he's a, he's a Kirby character. It's the brow. He said he'd be perfect. Is this Howard, how, Howard the Duck was created? Jack, no. Uh, the, uh, there was a, um, two or is it three part? There's a multi-part Fantastic Four comic book where the, the, the FF are, the Fantastic Four are, uh, in Dr. Doom's village and they can't get out. I think you've told me about this before where like you think Kirby had the prisoner on the background. Well, no Kirby. I think it's, it's, it's been, it's a given fact. I think almost it's been proven that, that this is loosely based, that he loosely based this on the prisoner, this, this multi-part story. Uh, but Do you he, remember what issues are around? Uh, it, oh gosh, you would ask me that. The, in the, <laughs> of course I would. Put in you the seventies or the eighties uh, issue run. Um, this is, uh, you know, at one point Kirby stopped, start, stop doing new, creations and just uh kind of coast it till he left for dc um so this might have been that it might have been a, a easy way to coast by okay. doing, uh, uh, doing this homage rip off take off you, when you said 70s you meant the issue 70s, 70s yeah, I, yeah, I, th yeah, I thought i thought you know, the yeah the runs the issue right because it was like kirby didn't go that long uh he was gone by issue around uh, issue 100 so uh yeah kirby we know that kirby when he would draw he had a, either a radio on or the tv on uh, as background noise all the mm -hmm. time. So, uh, and he, plus he, 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 he loved science fiction. He loved pulp magazines and stuff. So, uh, Kirby's, uh, so Jack Kirby, uh, you know, he goes to DC, he comes back to Marvel in 75, 76. And guess what they're going to do? They, they're going to, and it's announced in the bullpen pages, they're going to do a prisoner comic book. Mm -hmm. And Jack draws an entire 17 pages, ironically, <laughs> the first, episode, first issue of the prisoner uh -huh. it's all done it's been so and then uh but something happened uh they they, they did another stab at it they got Dingle Hart and gil kane to take a stab at it mm -hmm. and they didn't get as uh finished as uh as the kirby one did um but they're all the scripts there because Dingle Hart scripted it out and whereas the kirby was writer and artist and they but bootlegged all over the place throughout the decades uh, I had a Xerox copy of the uh, tour of it. They finally Titan uh, Publishing just uh, it was around the 50th anniversary of the Prisoner put out everything. They put it out officially. How was it? It's wonderful. I mean, it's great to have it an oversized artist edition book, all the Kirby issue and the Gil Kane Englehart stuff done, the script, articles, uh, everything. And uh, so, so uh, we got that. Um, I almost pulled or got from the library. Uh, Peter Milligan did a uh, prisoner or more modern one recently. Not Peter Milligan. I, I thought it was the Shane the Changing Man guy. No, uh, Dean Motter. You think of Dean Motter? No, Peter Milligan's the one I'm thinking of. Oh yeah, I, I, the I, one I saw. Uh, he did Peter Milligan did a he did a new Shade the Changing Man, but I don't think he ever did a prisoner. No, because um, then in eighty eight eighty nine. After Dark Knight and Watchmen and all the prestige format stuff was get really hot, uh -huh. they uh, DC got the rights to the Prisoner and they had Dean Motter, the, the creator of Mister X. I'm talking about something that was like within the last few years. Yeah, that's not. Oh, is that Milligan writing that? I don't think it's. I think it's a different Milligan. I don't think it's the same Milligan. Could be. Um, I, I just I, did, assumed... I didn't. I didn't write down. I, I have notes here, but I didn't write down the writer artist. Well, you're jumping ahead on me. Uh, the Dean Motter came out. Uh, it was a prestige format. It mm -hmm. was everything was really hot. And they got, and uh, it's a really interesting story where uh, uh, it turns out the village is in ruins, and number uh, uh, number uh, uh, Bagoon's character, the, who whatever you want to call him, Drake number six, whatever you want, he's still there. He's got a beard and everything, and they go back and find him there. And the Leo McKern number two shows up, and they go back to battling each other again. 
in this uh, graphic novel. Hmm. And then in 2000, 2018, the one you're talking about is a Titan along with the Kirby and Gil Kane reprint okay. and, and the Dean Motter. I didn't, I didn't read any of this. They reprinted. It. They did a brand new series and put it in a graphic novel. And I think it is Milligan. I don't know if it's the same Peter. I'll have to check that. That's, now you got me. I threw you off. I threw you off. Um, uh, but one, uh, one of the things so that, there's basically these are combo adaptations of their interesting ones. One of the things in the Prisoner remake is it opens with Caviezel finding a guy that's dressed in the original TV uh, the, the outfit, like the original uh, Village uh, Numbers outfit with the line outline. Right, which you, of course you can get one on eBay or some other places, obviously. And there's a there's fanzines now, and there's a, like I said, a souvenir shop at Port Marion. And in fact, when I went to England. Uh, I came up with my own little agenda and I was going to try to get up the whales and go to Port Marion, but I didn't do it. I Just wa- watch out for any weather balloons coming after you. <laughs> I want to say so. real quickly, Alan Moore also said that uh, he's put uh, two random prisoner references in uh, his work. He has one in uh, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, Black Dossier, which I don't remember. And I haven't read his second novel, Jerusalem, which every new prose novel Alan Moore puts out has the most difficult thing he's ever written. Forever was the first chapter of Voice of the Fire was has like 67 different words it uses. And then most people in Jerusalem have commented on there's this one chapter that's about James Joyce's daughter in an asylum around 1963 or so that in a offshoot on it supposedly patrick mcgoon was in that same hospital so there's an aside where patrick mcgoon runs in the novel not named patrick mcgoon runs by as he's being chased by a rover like weather balloon following him um, oh by the way you know i know we're wrapping up here but real quick the the, the, the uh why the weather balloon they mcgoon wanted a, a contraption i was going to mention that earlier. yeah it, I, I but i didn't know much and about he it. wanted it to go underwater go up walls scale up walls you know, fly, you know, what was it supposed to look like? Do you know? Kind of like a, uh, kind of like a dome, a small dome that would uh, kind of float across the ground. But it, it was a go kart underneath it. Uh, okay. Kind of like a, for lack of a better word, uh, like a like a, uh, like a like a cake, a, like a giant cake. I was going to say like a silent running robot. No, it was more. Uh, it was round and circus tip top type thing or uh, maybe not silent running maybe i'm thinking of a star trek robot or something yeah. but and they just couldn't get it to work they just it just failed and failed they were like and they were at wit's ends and they just had the, him and the production manager were looking up in the sky and they go what are those and then they ordered a bunch of them and, uh, i wanted to wind down by um talking about the the simpsons parody which probably was like uh do you remember it I, it's been a long time since I, but the fact they got magoon to actually voices yeah fantastic. he came back as number six it's the plot of it, you know, especially when Simpsons episodes or Simpsons season started to get not as good anymore. Almost every act was its own episode and they were like very loosely connected. So like the prisoner didn't come in until halfway through much or this last one. But it was about Homer doing a fake website where he started making stuff up. And in a plot line, when you know, the Simpsons are always very prophetic. They, you know, they famously predicted Trump being president and stuff like that. This one is one of those ones that ages too well, where Homer gets sent to the village because he writes that uh, fluoride being put into water is used by the government to uh, control people's minds. And in the age of conspiracy right now, that's a little too many people are subscribing to that. But anyway, uh, the joke is when he gets into the village, he keeps getting gassed. And the episode ends with a whole family going to the village. And Marge says at the very end, once you get used to the druggings, this isn't a bad place. <laughs> one, of the, one of the weird things I had trouble with the whole show, one of the reasons why the conformity stuff doesn't didn't age for me as well is because the village didn't really ask much of you besides giving up your name, which I mean is a lot. I'm not going to say it. it's a lot, but it seemed like they were giving you room and board for free and it was a luxury village. Oh, oh yeah, no, it was. And that's why a lot of people gave in. It was supposed to be this, res, you know, this retirement home for spies and the, the people that had too much information and they didn't want, they were too uh, important to let loose in the free world. The, then the conformity thing just, it just feels like what, what is, what is really being asked of them? Um, you know, well, he's not a number. He's a free man. And by being a free man means he has a name that he can, uh, through uh, rights for danger man, can't actually use. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you're getting too. Uh, a little too wonky. Yeah, there. But no, I mean, it, but. Uh, it, it's, it's a great show. I, I don't there's, there's, on the it note. plays with different subjects. Uh, every episode, which we didn't cover in, in, into detail, but each one uh, uh, tackles a different little subject to think about and chew on, you know. Uh, uh, psychoanalysis, drugs, 
Uh, I was not catching that. that really? That, you didn't? Uh, no. I think that would have helped me if you were there. What? Like, so I think there's. This, I think there's. A, uh, I think there's. A, I think he's tackling little subject matters that are you know poking at it. And, and but I not giving you answers. It's, it's, it's not going to give you answers. It doesn't give you any answers, but it just seemed like it was a little inconsistent. Like you, by the time you get to like the uh, the judicial system episode, which I did get, then you get to the Western episode next, and you're like, oh, how does this work? And the election, ep- there's an election episode. He's election episode. Office, yeah. You know, we're talking about politics. You know, he's having he's having his fun, uh, kind of poking at all these different uh, established things that we just take for granted. I'm not sure the metaphors work as an accurate representation, but I admire and was really impressed by the fact that he was doing it at this time. Like the swings he was making when TV was what it was right now, from yeah. what I know about it, which is, you know, my, my limited idea of, of 60s TV's Green Acres. So. <laughs> and he tries, but then he also tried to piece a little bit of the, uh, the secret agent aspect with the fights and stuff like that. And, uh, but yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's a really strange show and, you know, uh, it, depending on, you know, I think sometimes it gets forgotten about. It does and, seem like it's getting forgotten. And about. then sometimes it gets, uh, then it, but then I'll, I'll come, but, or it's like it's way select down the fans, list. Re, it's select fans really push it up though. Uh, but it seems like, you know, uh, the people that are really in the know about television history seem to know that this is an important one, an important step. I don't know. I think it is, but, it, but I just, I think it's fun. And, and I, and, if not for anything uh, better, just watch the, f- the fun watching Magoo and, and the, the village, the Port Marion sets wonderful. And uh, the thing that really exists is amazing. And just the music and uh, uh, you get to see uh, who's who of British actors coming through there. It's uh, wonderful. A Kafka S Bond movie. You know, <laughs> and uh, I, it's, it, I, yeah, even with my tepid recommendation, I'm still. Like, like it's it's a goat. I I, I can well. See hopefully, maybe I uh, you know if you live long enough and where the world stays around long enough, you you revisit, come back. You revisit the village and hopefully maybe you'll get a, a better taste of it. Hope so. Well, Ted, I think that's enough for this episode. Thanks everybody for listening. Shane, all I have to say is, be seeing you. <laughs> I am not a number. I am a free man. Thanks everybody for listening. <laughs>